Welcome to Forsyth Elements on Projection. I have prepared a 10 part series on the imagination for uh, those who would like to um, dig into the imagination and uh, perhaps learn a little more about the role it plays in uh, projection. The series have taken me around two years to research and these 10 parts um, see in our series uh, might be viewed as a, as a kind of an extraction, a sel selection I've made and also based on my own perspectives on the imagination. Now we are not talking about that imagination that I have that I can imagine myself sitting in an island Fiji with a sundowner um, or, or, or uh, can instantly teleport me to the 11th dimension. That's not what we are talking about. Rather, I thought it might be appropriate if I <clears throat> perhaps use a few images of the countryside to convey um, through these images a um, like a, a preliminary idea of the imagination. Mm -hmm. So let's examine this this uh, image a little better. I'm going to take this off and that off. Well, we have here a beautiful countryside in uh, the Cape Cape Town wine, wine, Winelands. It's early morning, the sun just broke the tip of the mountains and there is like mists uh, on the water due to the temperature differences. Here in the middle of the picture in the distance, about 12 o'clock, it looks like there is even an antelope uh, perhaps standing next to the water side, but one can't really see it very clearly. And uh, in f uh, on the reflection on the water, the mountains reflects there, the trees reflects there. And here in the foreground where it, it truly looks, looks like a, a mirror there is um, a, a kind of an opaque image that says appearances. These reflections on waters are very ancient, are very ancient images. Um, when I mean ancients, pre, pre Platonic, uh, pre Heraclitian, pre um, Pythagoras. In fact, it goes so far back um, to the ancient Egyptian mythologies. So, this is uh, part of why I am using these images is to kind of convey um, the subtle meaning of the imagination. In this image we have a furrow or a ditch with flowing water, um, with water flowing down it. You can see it cascading in the foreground and there again there's, uh, there I have appearances um, um, as a feature. Well, which appearances are we talking about here? Well, on the sides of this, of the ditch there is, there are plants growing and where the water ripples, their images are not very um, clear as here in the foreground to the right, to your right hand side. Um, there are some clear images as in a mirror of those little plants standing on the edge there. Now this, there is a mythological image of this that you probably heard. It is the myth of Narcissus who looks at his own reflection on the surface of water and he falls in love with himself uh, and he disappears into the stream. This is 
the meaning of this um, mirror images that we that we are using in connection with the imagination the deeper meaning of this we are going to unfold attempt to unfold uh, throughout our 10 part series on the imagination to be to go back to our original uh, images we see there that we want to um, show the stability of the images on the shore on uh, that that's there on the bank and we also have this image here wait a minute um sorry i i have we have this beautiful image too which i forgot about because it disappeared under my my <laughs> obs recorder thing so there are activities on the banks of the on of this dam uh, you can see the looks like big tip lorries uh, or, or trucks have just dropped off some gravel there on the, there's some activity going on perhaps a, a road is getting built but the point is the images on the banks of the dam of uh, um, on the walls of the dam are stable the trees that grows there in the soil are stable with reference to the image in the water to images in the water and this is what we want to convey with the moving images uh, in in this particular uh, uh, image so uh, um, uh, with that i have prepared a series of powerpoint slides for this particular video um, in fact, for all my videos, I use a PowerPoint because I, I think that it's a little crazy to try and add lib this kind of thing. These are, these are my um, only publications I have and they contain uh, some of uh, some lifelong studies on the subject. With that, We'll begin our PowerPoint. There is an, an ancient uh, maxim on the temple to Apollo in Delphi, the ancient Roman city if of 2000 BC that says, certainty brings insanity. Doesn't that sound familiar? In our present day, where even in our high sciences of physics, we have, <coughs> excuse me, a plethora of uh, ambiguous uh, principles. Nothing is really certain. Um, and so, th this is how I would like to open this uh, introduction. To the imagination and uh, hopefully by the end of this we'll come to a conclusion about what is certain and what is not the internal creative potential of the human soul resides within each individual each of us have the cap capacity to imagine to to learn to um, paint beautiful pictures, to write beautiful stories, to make beautiful videos. I think that <clears throat> this, this is uh, this an innate part of the human soul, of the whole human, uh, of us as, as human beings, and through a poi. So learning and uh, curiosity and the formation of good thought habits uh, is all part of the joy of discovery of Richard, Richard Feynman and it's the essence of human nature and our our this discovery is the essence of our um, advancing to a future that is unknown essentially our understanding which is the principal means of discrimination provides pervades 
the whole of our associative mental structure as a whole psychological operation. That our understanding is governed by forming imagination is not well understood at all. Hence, discovering these views on the imagination in ancient Greek works has been an eye-opener to me. There are other people who have written about this. There is the, the poet Kathleen Rain. She's a, a Neoplatonist. She writes about this imagination which she learns from Thomas Taylor and uh, from whose works, um, amongst others, we draw, we have drawn upon to create this series on the imagination. She says that imagination is a kind of a lost knowledge and I indeed agree with her. I think that this is lost psychology of imagination. There is a link in the description to the William Blake and William Yates, the two poets which she treat of, um, if you're interested in listening to her. We may say that life soul, our imagination and our intellectual perception functions as a whole unity and is the very source of all reason, creative, internal forming intuitions and this, that this is interconnected with our principles of knowledge and their discrimination may become apparent to us. Why is it relevant to know about imagination in our time? Divine imagination possesses subtle interforming vibrations or media that governs our fast-moving judgments or intuition. For the experts, the relevance for the experts on epistemology, computation and artificial intelligence, this is an interior projective psychology, the imagination, and forms the beginning of the subtle aspects of formation of images in our in reasoning, uh, our intellect, intellectual cognition and formation of images in the intellect of all humans. Even though good approximations of perception in, have been made uh, of vi vision systems in artificial intelligence, we think that imitations of human perception, which is driven by the unity of understanding and forming intuition, may be the best we can do. For the experts on what I would like to say precision physics, philosophy and analytics, the long-range existence of this internal forgotten psychology of the imagination, which appears to be an aspect of a most ancient interactive, interforming psychological relation with the phenomenal world, and its virtual absence in postmodern psychology may indicate some of these following opportunities to improve our theories and to engender a greater understanding of the function of our world interaction. Our selection of heuristic input seems to be protective of principles leading to the rejection of others which lead to incomplete scientific inquiries. And we add today that there is a dire need for um, sound science, uh, I think that um, th there is uh, big interests in big places uh, that skews science, but that's a, a different conversation. And lastly, we add to these opportunities the problem of blind, the blind in exception, acceptation of convention on fundamental aspects and ideas of the world, which we deduct from the past and which is truly blind. It is, pro it is projected on future operation and function. We have an abundance of evidence in the history of our world principles that unification is what is to be sought for in our theories. Adding to this the rigid adherence to theoretical, theoretical structures and their limited use in free invention and discovery, 
which Einstein addresses in his Herbert Spencer lecture. See our Einstein series for more information. But Proclus says of this unification in 450 AD, he says, this psychological unification internal is to be sought through the internal practice of imagination, a thought practice through to agathon that means an inward looking psychological movement to the good hence the internal psychology of the passive forming imagination reflection on waters the forming governor of the formation of appearances on the surface of water flowing waters within our own frames or reference or world perspectives. A world perspective immediately formed on the basis of sense contact with external sense objects and an internal excitement of the formation of images, such as which occur in phototransduction, which we'll come to shortly. There is no tabula rasa as Hume held. There's no blank mind. There's no world without forming soul or spirit. Imaginatio, the Latin word for imagination, may then be loosely described as an aspect of the passive material forming automata, automata of our world perspective. The formation of images resident within our cognition or looking occur as self-forming functional unity in its operation. May we not say that underneath the analysis of the mechanics of visual perception, photons, the action potential and the firing of single neurons lie a subtle internal and hidden world of psychological function, a unity that governs a marvelous and instantaneous capacity to form images from vast dimensions of information. A formation not in any step stepwise functionality like as one would climb, climb up on a staircase or put one foot in front of the other, not in that way, but forming instantly and it's dynamic in space-time, it's not linear, at once and forming as a unity. Hence, the fragments of information which appear to function alone and by themselves, subject to observer measurement, existing in physical material things, are but minute aspects of a greater harmonic interpsychological internal psychological web of resonance we say a hidden psychological order in itself the photons the communicators of electromagnetic fields of refraction and reflection of colors that reflects off surfaces that bounces off from and lands upon uh, the retina which acts as, as a phototransducer, produces neurochemical sig signals, ions, potential vo voltage differences that travels through the optical nerve to the visual system of the brain where this information is processed. According to, for example, Caltech's De Silva, the dynamics of information contained in the visual message of photons is the result of a photoreceptor population phenomenon across space and time, that is where and when photons hit the retina. It is a dynamic spatio-temporal encoding of the physical world. The last part is, my, is our emphasis. We'll put this in the link below. Encoding, part of encoding here is the idea of mapping from say the third dimension to the fourth dimension uh, uh, or higher, a term that we often hear today. An encoding, a taking in or absorbing one kind of energy 
vib the vibration of photons reflecting from surfaces of the external world of objects and falling on the retina, converting these into electrical signals who contain information about the sense environment. This information collected is described as the language of the brain by the above author, for instance. He says, Joseph Alberts, an artist, sorry, hence says Joseph Alberts, an artist quoted, quoted in the same above link, in visual perception, a color is almost never seen as it really is, as it physically is. This fact makes color the most relative medium in art. But this statement is no modern invention. Invention, The statement indeed mirrors in a most, a most ancient discrimination, but based on very different principles. Otherwise stated, we behold, we see the appearances or phantasmata of the refraction and reflection from light, color of external sense objects, the true nature of which objects we possess no immediate knowledge. Do we not, given these considerations, possess in our total understanding or knowledge a self-formed mirrored symmetry, a kind of simile or resemblance of sense objects based upon sense contact and the collection of incoming sense information and its immediate processing in our brain. The idea of that we discussed a little earlier on of a mirror image on the surface of water. We have those beautiful mountains and the reflection on water. We have reflection on cars. On a, This is a reflection on a car, on the roof of a car. Reflection of the tree you can see there on the roof how the tree is reflecting there and the reflection is a slight distortion because of the curvature of the roof. And I included this distortion um, in here to, for a specific reason to show that we don't have, as appearances in reflections of mirrors, we don't have, um, we, we have an appearance of, of objects from bouncing off of, from light bouncing off of objects in our own cognition. Here is another beautiful picture on a, probably a Cape Town beach somewhere where there is, you can see there in the foreground, uh, there is a tall building that reflects, the other buildings reflects on the receding waters. Here we have that genius who took these photos, a true philosopher, philosopher, photographer, thinker, a man that takes his world seriously and who is a very highly accomplished human being. These views that we've just seen is, mo is, a, is a view that most ancient men and women indeed acknowledge a very long time ago. Indeed, say the experts, the whole of our sensory system, that is the whole of our body, hearing, smelling, touching, seeing, tasting, indeed all of our sensing possesses its basic nature as a transducer, something that converts one form of energy into another. But how could we now say is such a sensing associative unity of function and its forming automata? forming such a convertive um, and assimilative Im imagery in our intellect. An internally converted Im imagery indeed of figures, forms, impressions, 
forming from external sense and objects of sense pervades through the whole of our resonating, sensing, interactive theater, the whole of human being. We are, we are our vibrations, if you like. We'll come back to this, which constitutes the whole unity governing of our intellect and all its forming intuitions. Looking or our perception seem to us to be the very center of our interconnection with the external world of objects or the objects of knowledge, of which we only at any particular time, like reflections on water, possess a certain assimilated information or knowledge about. But looking, the whole unity of all our sensations, in that internal place, it's an internal um, coming together, it's an internal formation, is the center of our world interaction. Indeed, our looking, a unity and a wholeness that governs and drives our world interaction, possess the flawless and innate capability of formation and creating through the totality of our world perspective, flawlessly moving images, impressions and judgments. An internally formed, assimilated world indeed, a, a, and converted, transduced forming formation on the basis of the nature of contact with external sense objects and sense perception. A conversion, we may say, from external impulses, resonances, existing through the whole operation of our the resonating associative system. One part which cannot, with prudence, be dislodged or taken away from another part, for its whole function or purpose is to be formative within every world perspective. This internal formation of our world of sense perception, may we say self-formed mirror reflections, as in the image we, the images we have seen, in its depth sense, is the internal world of our perception. Impressions formed in the brain, in the whole unity of the human being, are in, internal psychological formations collected from all of the very exceedingly great complexity of information that reaches the internal theater of our intellect and cognition, which is a unity. Hence, self-formed, true appearances or phantasmata is the nature of our interconnection with what is known. Indeed, you may find it interesting to know that it took me the longest of time to understand myself as a resonating biophysiological being, a whole unity, a complexity of myriads of resonances, hearing, vision, feeling, touching, a forming and formed unity. Such an idea may even be weird. To some people. Hence it appears to us that the images of forms in the psychology of cognition and intuition possesses a subsistence on the basis of atomic and intra-atomic forming spectra or resonance. To us therefore resonance or vibration is none other than living forming natural life. In all of its complexity, variety, in all of its abundance and its eternal forming and formative subsistence. It seems to us that the investigation of our world, since for instance Copernicus and Galileo, led us to opine that there must be must have been a first living cell. Perhaps this eukaryote came into being at a very precise time in a distant past. But now we have to wonder how such a cell could acquire life, or how such a cell could have evolved sentience. As if sentience or life, harmonics and its movement is separate from psychological contact, resonance, and as if we are separate from Mother Earth. We may be in a dire need, say I, say we, 
of a kind of, of another kind of direction in psychological inquiry. But what else could there be to look for if everything we look for is existing as a pure biological material evolutionary machinery and its mechanics? Our world into action appear to be on this basis purely with ourselves upon a biophysiological individuation of matter itself. I must say, I, I was astonished when I saw this in the work of Carl Jung and our own projective participation mystique. A psychological hypno hyp hypnosis on this beautiful planet of ours. We'll come back to hypnosis and uh, at a future time. Hence our laws, in our laws we seek the cause of functioning of an objective universe who appear indeed to present itself to us. From hence we conclude in our mechanics and the marvelous theories that this biophysiological machinery is the summit of all evolution. Indeed, this opinion seemed to us to be limited and limiting, important as its history seems to be. But anthropoi, human beings, multitudes of human beings, we deny not. The first, the fast moving, easy filling in the, the dot dot dot, the evolutionary blank of it seems whatever opinion is needed here, appear to me to be indeed self formed mirrored projection of the thinker which he or she projects upon the external world and upon a past through which he or she seeks a stability of survival and certainty of being. May we not instead rather admit this, to come back to an earlier remark, that information, the language of the brain, thus collected from contact with sense and external object is formed and forming of world appearances. And upon this basis, we may have to admit that even the whole of our past would be in itself an appearance. But such an admission now leaves us rather empty handed, for together with it hangs the question as to who it is or how the interior unity of appearances came to be forming in our intellect. If then the unity of image and formation and its formative psychology would constitute a crucial element to the collection of sense information within our perception and the formation of images, what indeed would we be able to say about the self-forming formation? because no one else is forming it, we are forming it ourselves. The appearances of form, images and impressions. Would there not be interior, interactive, forming media, such as exists, for instance, with a wholeness who comprehends with, in itself, parts? Thus it seems to us indeed, as men of physics, have already shown of the problems with fragmentation, that wholeness would be a direction that psychology should, psychology should be taking to inquire toward, in place of the minutiae of analysis in and of the part. We may say that the unreduced unity of the looking of each looker in this knowledge and his knowledge of him or herself must be entirely formative as a certain wholeness indeed. For this wholeness, this unity, we think would appear to be a proper analogy to investigate of the perception of every particular member of the human race, race, with reference to a vaster wholeness such as the universe. And in addition, we have observed that the auto formation, the automatic formation of images in the mind of every person is flawlessly formative and forming. There's no analysis or investigation or selection of aspects to be formed. Nor then would there be any inspection 
or critical thought, judgment or discursive, stepwise or repetitive artificial compression necessary in its formation, for this is the very nature of all forming sensing automata. Would there not now be a necessity to admit that looking is the principal means of image formation? Would we not then only at would we not then only admit the obvious that our looking and its assimilative internal automata is necessary for instantaneous instantaneous image forming and the formation in the human soul? But this is exactly equivalent in its psychology to saying that the observer is necessary for the laws of nature to exist. For the laws of nature are in themselves internally formed intuitions or discoveries, free inventions of the human mind, as that friend of everyone Einstein said. To move then beyond the self-imposed limits of reduction, we may observe that reduction itself is not appropriately reflective of the being of sensible natures who possesses all psychological operations as complex unities or certain wholenesses. It seems indeed to us that there is very appropriately, appropriately a search given this world interpretation for and a perplexion of how life, sentience, being, uh, could arise. Hence the selection of heuristics and, and, and analysis is its own limit. To seek in minutia for the essence of being is a limiting exercise and virtually impossible, we think, to find. Neither wholeness nor unity is fragmented. Moreover, more ancient people have already shown that complexity arises from simplicity and that simplicity, which is a unity, possesses an essential subsistence before even wholeness, from which hangs sensible material complexity. A discursive or iterative operation, therefore, is not of the nature of unity, rather is natural to the world of hypotheses, which conjecture is necessary to evolve our knowledge, not from its minutia, but from a principled intuition. But here is the thing. In every principal discovery of the function and operation of our world, there appears to be a unifying effect in its operation. Moreover, we think that these discoveries point us to a unity, a greater knowledge of unification with and through wholeness. For the idea of unity seems to us to possess in its function and nature a certain analogy with wholeness which is unknown to us but which in the context of our discussion appear in both instances to be forming and formative, such as scrap that part. Hence, we may indeed have to admit that unity constitutes a deeper hierarchy of function and operation of the psychology of the automata of internal assimilation and intuition or perceiving forming behavior, which in every respect appear to be psychologically formed and forming as a unity. This limit is in our passionate acceptance of and knowledge of the world as it appears to us, reflections on the surfaces, the surface of water. Without this admission, it, it appears to us that the whole world of self-formed appearances in our own intellect or soul, for we are in ourselves complex unities, will remain an intract intractable problem, as is evidenced by our long and fruitless search for consciousness and the beginning of life in the West. Hence we ask in this series presentation, what 
The nature could be of the whole formation of images, of whole perceiving impressions, instantly formed, and what the nature is of our fast-moving conclusions, our fast, flawlessly drawn judgments and opinions from our world perspective. Upon what possible principle could our world perspective, so flawlessly and wonderfully forming, be at rest with in the whole of the world of our perception and its appearances in our own minds. Is this not the world of sensation of both ancient and modern men? We still grapple with the same issues. This brings us to the lost psychology of the projective forming intuition and formative imagination of the fantasy or imagination. And this also brings us to the end of this part one. Thank you for watching. We hope you got some uh, food for thought. Thank you very much.